of that, Tyler. Uh, they re-signed Will Harris. But I think there are three, the, the two most impactful signings that they've had t- to this point has been Emmanuel Mosley and Cameron Sutton. Those guys were teammates at Tennessee. It's going to be great to get them in the Honolulu Blue. And um, obviously you add them as a, like a one-two corner punch or you add in a Jeff Okuda, Jerry Jacobs, someone in that line of the, the way you mix it in or whatever because you're going to have people to mix in Jerry Jacobs, Okuda. But I don't think they're done. I, I really don't. I think in the draft they're going to get a cornerback. But it, this is, this kills all people's scenarios where they would draft a corner at six. So I'm happy about that. Yeah, and, and uh, I do agree. Yeah. Um about that but there are some people saying like oh that means we're like totally like off the market of getting a cornerback in the draft and like this does not mean that yeah. um mosley and sutton i think are awesome pieces i think it's really going to help us but those are those are guys you want to have around to where you know if we do draft a young corner with a ton of like developmental upside and um you know he's a got a ton of potential this is kind of a perfect situation in him because you can he can come in. You can learn from two guys who kind of made their way uh, through the league. I mean, and uh, and you know, r- risen up like Mosley was um, an undrafted free agent, I believe, um, and he's definitely found a way to um, you know make a home for himself in the NFL. And Cam Sutton, who is just an absolute dog, and you know it's a great signing when the t- when um, fans of the other fan base are like shit, man, I really, uh, man, it sucks that you guys signed them. Oh my God. Like you're going to love them. Like they were like totally pissed off and upset with the Steelers front office. They did did not re-sign Cam Sutton. So that is a great sign for us. And uh, I mean, if you just watch the guy play and you just watch the film, the dude is a straight dog. Uh, I love both of these signings and I, uh, I like that we brought some, a lot of our guys back. It does give some culture. Um, You know, it shows that there's a culture change. It shows guys want to be here. And honestly, Anzalone, after after guys like um, Tremaine Edmonds reset the market, um, kind of at at his value and position, um, I don't hate Anzalone at six million. It's a great value signing. I like all the moves we've made so far. I think Brad Holmes has got a B plus from me so far this off season. Yeah, you know, here's the thing about the Alex Anzalone coming back to Detroit. I remember I was listening to podcasts. Spitting Chicklets, which is a hockey podcast, so if you're not a hockey fan, you wouldn't get it. But um, they were talking to Rod Brindamore, and Rod Brindamore played for the Flyers. He won a Stanley Cup with the Carolina Hurricanes when they finally won a cup in Carolina. And one of the things that he said on that podcast that I kind of sticks with me to my gums is like a lot of these players that um, you like when they when they're trying to become like a real legitimate team, right? They want to, like, just win it by themselves. You know, they want to win it by themselves. They want to be the group that wins it uh, and, and kind of pushes forward. Um, and the Flyers, they changed after the 97 Cup where they got absolutely lambasted by the Red Wings, which that was great. Um, they totally made over the team. And they took away some critical pieces that were um, depth, like a depth guys. Like, um, there was a couple guys that they took out of uh, the lineup and they, they got new guys in and it never worked in Philadelphia. And that was the reason why in, they were like, let's just, let's run it back and let's keep it going. I think Alex Anzalone is one of those guys like that. They wanted to keep because obviously he's a critical piece to what they're doing. But I also think that like the reason the lions signed Alex Anzalone is this really refer reaffirms that my hunch that the lions are going to go draft the court line uh, linebacker in the draft. Like they're, that's what they're going to do because he was instrumental in, um, like, mentoring Malcolm Rodriguez, Derek Barnes. So that's why I think that's a big, huge deal why they signed him. Yeah, I mean, Alex Anzalone, I mean, he led the team in tackles last year. He had 125 tackles, a pick, uh, and a couple sacks. Look, I mean, I understand. Dude, I was, like, I hated Anzalone for, like, the last two years. But the last ten weeks – I mean, he definitely played a lot better, and he saved himself a spot on this team and earned himself a new contract, and that's just facts. He was very pivotal in turning that around. I think what honestly was a part of the struggle in his play the first eight weeks, and, and you hear you heard Coach Campbell talk about it in a, in a press conference, was that he was so worried about trying to help everyone else do their job and trying to help teach everybody else and give everybody else their assignments 
that it was like he was kind of lacking in his own because he's trying to teach and help everybody out during like games and and even in practices and warm ups. Once he started, you know, leading by example and focusing on himself and his assignments and kind of, you know, um, allowing to teach that way versus neglecting his own duties, he got a lot better. Which yeah, is good because I mean, your you know your your poor performance was due to selflessness and development of others. I mean, that's that's a great like if there's any reason for you to have a dip in production, you want it to be a selfless reason like that. So like, I can't be totally mad at that. No, I think the Alex Anzalone sign is just is just what I just said. Like, it's a leadership, it's culture, and it's trying to keep the band together. Not the band together in totality but just keep critical pieces of your team well, together. Well, the guy, I mean, he's still fairly young too. And I still think like last year was probably his best year of his career. And I still think the best football is ahead of him. I mean, linebackers a little bit, it takes a little bit longer. If you're not like an absolute athletic freak, like a Roquan Smith or a Deion Jones or like, yeah. you know, a guy that's just an absolute like athletic monster freak, then it does just... take you a few years to like develop and learn that position because you're the IQ. You're like the quarterback of the middle of the defense. I mean, you, there's a lot to learn and a lot to know, and I think it just makes sense for this regime, the scheme, you know, the players involved. Like, still go, definitely go draft a linebacker, please. Maybe two draft talent in that linebacker room because the Lord knows we need it. But it is becoming one of the least important positions on the defense. Mm -hmm. And at least if you have a guy like Anzalone, he he has a very high IQ, and um, it just helps provide comfortability and. Um, familiarity with you know the scheme and some of the things they want to do yeah and, and i think it's funny because i think like one of the reasons that like i'm so high on like them re-signing alex anzalone isn't because of like alex anzalone the player but i look at like what the lions did after they started to get a really cohesive unit in the front in the front four with houston with uh, hutch with Aleem, with um bugs you know they had they had things going what it makes the job easier for a linebacker when you're off your defensive linemen are winning at their point of attack. So I look at this and I go, listen, like at the sixth pick, you're going to be at a great opportunity to go draft a guy like maybe Will Anderson's off the board. Maybe Tyree Wilson's off the board, but maybe Jalen Carter is there or Tyree Wilson's there. I don't think Will Anderson's going to be there at all, but who knows? You never know because some people might like Tyree Wilson more than Will Anderson. We'll see how it goes. I like Tyree Wilson a lot more than I like Will Anderson, to be honest, especially in this defense. But if you can get one of those guys like Tyree Wilson or Jalen Carter, I think you're going to see the best of your linebackers that you haven't seen yet. I think what they're what you're missing is like, okay, Houston's a great uh, pass rusher on passing downs, right? But you need a guy who like who can like be the guy with um with Hutch on like the first and second down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and absolutely. It, and it could be Josh Pascal. You could have a pass rushing unit where you put out Hutch, you put out Kaminsky, you put out Pascal, and then you put out maybe a Tyree Wilson, and you're freaking gelling. And then if you want to, and Aaron Glenn's feeling a little frisky, like oh yep, we're gonna do some you know cute stuff. We put five down linemen and put Houston in that bitch. And then you're really cooking with peanut oil. Yeah, and or you have or you have Houston as like a rushing off the ball linebacker, but like, you know, standing up to kind of rush yeah. the pass on Aiden side. Like they kinda of like they did a little bit last year at the end of the year. Well, I don't know if you heard my well, you I don't know if you heard my video that I did out the Friday. Um so what I said about it is like you look at the four teams in this, in the AFC and NFC championships, right? Eagles, 49ers. Chiefs, Bengals, right? If I told you Eli Apple was the best cornerback on the Bengals, you would be like, hell no, no, no way. Well, he was. And then for the Chiefs, it was Janarius Sneed, and he's not no name brand either. And then for the 49ers, it was Traverius Ward. Now, Traverius Ward's pretty damn good, but that front seven really stirs a drink for him. There's a key, right. in, all, there's a key in all four of those teams. Their front sevens were legit. Like their corners didn't have to do as much because that corn those defensive linemen, <laughs> linebackers, they're getting to the ball, they're getting to the quarterback. Yeah. Like it's like boom. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you're looking at as the Lions, it's like, dude, our cornerback play has been so ass. But if you think about it, like 
Dude, you can't really ask a corner to cover somebody for four or five, four and a half seconds, five seconds. I mean, you just can't. It's it's the NFL. Elite uh, re- receivers have elite change of direction, elite speed, and they you know can get creative when they're you know coming off their breaks. So like, you know, if you're not getting to the quarterback within you know two and a half seconds, I, your corners have a hard time saying a chance because, dude, in any scheme, if you can't just get to the quarterback and you're trying to just you know play like sagging off deep coverage i mean it's gonna be a long ride you know what i mean it's it's so i agree with you there and yeah dude we're like one piece away from our defensive line being like or our you know yeah our defensive line being like super scary and legit because like like you said we pretty much have all of our depth and rotational pieces yeah which Dude, if we get another like stud on the other side, like a Tyree Wilson, or you know, or even like a versatile guy in the middle, like Jalen Carter yeah, or Will Anderson, yeah. if you get any of those premier guys at six, like, dude, you're talking about like we have one of the most promising young defensive lines in the entire league. And I think that people are missing the guy that could really be the X factor in this defense. It's Levi Anzarike. We haven't seen much of Levi Anzarike, and he, you know what? He hasn't played the you know. When he played, he wasn't that great. But I look at it like this, dude. If he comes in and is just a pass rushing fiend, like I'll take it all day long. Well, think about it. If he becomes, if he becomes like, like I said, we've drafted and and like and signed off the waivers our our depth and rotational guys. If you can, if you can get to a position where Levi is healthy, I mean, he he was on a lot of people's boards in the first and second rounds of that of that draft he was taking. It's a shame because he was hurt, yeah. and I know he gets a lot of he gets the bus label and he gets a lot of flack. He's just been hurt, man, which which sucks. But um, I think that if he's if, if this is a big if because his injuries are a big concern, if he becomes healthy and turns out to be the guy that we took drafted him to be, and that's your fourth or fifth down the chain lineman, like shit man you're 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 all right no in the the reality like you look at the eagles right they were a good pass rushing team because they were deep at defensive tackle and edge and they can get to the quarterback and they were good same thing they just rotate guys all day long same thing with the chiefs i know frank clark is a guy who is like he's a clutch pass rusher but chris jones stirs that drink and they got george Karloftis. they got guy michael dana like they can really do some some damage. It's same thing with the Bengals. You look at the – don't even talk about the 49ers because that's exactly what the Lions should strive to be like, the 49ers, because their their defensive line is just – they kill people. They are it literally killing. should have been illegal for them to sign Javon Hargrave. That was fucked. Dude, I don't even – I don't even <laughs> – see, this is, what, this is what I'm talking about with cap space. Like, everyone talks about cap space like, oh, my God, we got 15 million cap space. I – don't give a fuck because guess what all these teams find cap space out of thin air i remember a couple years ago the saints were like uh they were like 79 million dollars in the hole and they suddenly came like they suddenly found a space i was like how the hell did you do that like you know what i'm saying like what the hell and even the vikings today like they cleared like I think they cleared like fifteen million dollars in cap space restructuring Kirk Cousins deal. I was just it's an, it's unreal. Yeah, I mean they you know they exactly they I mean you can get very creative with it. And you know, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so they can you know they can get very creative with it. They can do a lot of things with it and, and the good teams find a way. Um, and yeah, as long as you're re-signing guys and you find guys that are good fits, I mean, we've freed up some cap with some of the moves we made already. And, you know, you do a, you do a, a Vitae Harris cut and then you restructure, restructure. Taylor Decker, you restructure, you restructure golf, you restructure a couple of guys. Like, dude, we could probably get up to 30, 40 million in cap right now if we wanted to. But, uh, you know, I don't know if Brad Holmes is necessarily a big fan of kicking the can down the road. Well, here's my. I, I, what, I was gonna say this, okay? We're trying to build this thing for a sustained success, you know. Well, that's why I said yesterday on that video that I did, uh, or the audio, or whatever. But um, I, I, I think that Brad Holmes, like, I think he's willing to kick some money down the road. But like I was telling people, like, 
I know he likes Charles Harris. I know he likes Romeo Aquara. I think that the, at, in the end, they're going to restructure those deals, I think, because I think there's much more to give from those two. The guy that I would be willing to bet gets cut at some point, and they can announce the post-June first cuts tomorrow, is Vitae. I think Vitae might yeah. be gone. Um, I think there's a part of the Lions that are like hoping that it works, and they're going to see if it... Maybe they could restructure at some point, but like, I think that the Lions are one. I don't think they're done in this free agent class. I, I just think that they're, well, they're not the, done. The big the big V signing was probably my one of my least favorite signings ever. So no, you know what the the big V signing here's here's the problem where it went. Okay, big V was when Patricia and Quinn they signed this guy like poor uh, poor Vitae because he came into a horrible situation. They made him a tackle. He wasn't a tackle. Like, the Eagles used him pr- primarily as a guard, and he was better at being a guard than a tackle. And these clown fucks, they're, like, putting him at tackle thinking he's going to be the next, like, Jason Peters or or, or Trent Williams, like, s- something along that lines. Like, they're paying him this money because they think he's going to be, like, great. But, like, Vitae was never a tackle. He was a guard. Well, he, was a, he was a backup guard nonetheless. You know, and and they moved him, and when uh when Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell they moved him back to guard. I mean, he did have some good, he did have some nice success, but it's like, dude, it's hard because of the price tag on him. Like, it's not his fault. I mean, if we had, if we had him for much less, like it would be one thing. But I mean, the dude's carrying around like a ten million dollar cap hit. Yeah, the, the, carrying around a cap hit that big is like huge. Like, I you just don't want to do it. So. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's. I think Vitae is gonna be the one that's gonna be cut loose. Also, we brought back one of your guys, Tyler. Will Harris is back too. And Jesus. I, and listen, I, I know people are gonna, they're gonna be mad at it, or they're gonna say like, why did we bring him back, Will Harris? He's a depth guy. I like him as a depth guy. I don't care if he's like, if he's not the greatest, because most of your depth guys are not going to be great. I just, I just know that I can't stand watching this dude as like our CB two or three, which he had to play a lot last year. Well, not really his fault because I mean, but he was a third round, he was a third round pick, so it's like okay, you should be better than absolute ass. But apparently, he was like our highest graded corner, which is also that's, crazy. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's just, it's kind of sad. But the, rea- <laughs> the reality, <laughs> the reality of the situation is like. He's not as bad as people think. It's just because he was thrusted into these roles where he's like, he's like covering like um, Stefan Diggs. It's like, dude, that guy is not going to cover Stefan Diggs. It's like, what are you right. doing? But they were, Dan Campbell was like, I had to do it. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. I mean, you stick him on, right. I mean, I get it. You stick him on a wide receiver three, you stick him on a wide receiver four, you know, you, you stick him, you know, somewhere, you know, you, you stick that guy on like a, you know, a, Corey Davis, you know, type of dude. I mean, he'll be he'll be all right. You stick him on a guy that's like you know is kind of slow and is kind of a, like a lard ass, but you just are like, all right, Will Harris, you go cover that guy because uh, he's... see what would what would be helpful is we if you could get him to a position where he's strong enough and physical enough to be able to maybe guard some of those tight ends. That would be where that would be helpful. Yeah, that would be really helpful. Uh, I, I, dude, I see Will Harris as like a slot corner sometimes. Like he just looks, I think he could be really good in a slot. It's gonna be interesting with this, with the way that they signed Mosley and Sutton. What's how the corners are gonna shake out? And it makes me kind of wonder because if they are, which I mean, if they are serious about drafting a corner in the first round or the second round, which I really do think we should, just because there's a lot of depth and talent at corner. If they're serious about that there's going to be like someone's on their way out most likely. I mean, and le- you know, unless you're hoping that like Mosley sticks around, like is around for just a year to kind of like help shape and mold and allow like Okuda to come into his own. A- unless that's the plan. I mean, a guy like Okuda or Jerry Jacobs are going to be on their way out, but I-, I think they really love Jacobs and I think he's a great depth piece. Like he'll always be a fantastic like CB four. Uh, CB3, Jerry, CB4. I think Jared Jacobs could be a great slot corner, too. So, like, I don't think that they, like, hate him. I mean, they, they got him as an undrafted free agent, and the guy works his ass off. The fans love think, him. He's a dog. I, like, pers- Personally, I think this is the way it's going to strike out. I think that Jared Jacobs is going to be t- part of your top three corners. And I think the guy on the outside that I don't think people are going to 
really realize this right now, but I think they're going to realize it by the time we get to, after the draft. And I think it's Okuda's days are numbered. It's just the way it is. Like I think I, I that's how I see it too. The writing assignment kind of seems on the wall. It's it's kind of like I feel like it's this regime's way of saying like, look, man, like you it's time to nut up or shut up. Like if you come out here and you ball your ass off and you force us to keep you, like we would love that. But I don't think they're necessarily expecting that from him either. No, I think that these moves for the cornerbacks, like Moses, it's an insurance start. policy on Okuda. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. That's exactly what I was going to get to. But here's the thing. In the next segment, I have a critical question to ask you, Tyler. So if you're on the podcast, follow us along the next uh, in the next segment. We're gonna have, I have a critical question for Tyler to answer. <laughs> 